Swanson, Dr. Denstead, members and guests, I'm incredibly honored to have been chosen to give the Ramon Gutierrez lecture this year. Uh, I certainly wish that we were there in person. By way of brief introduction, I've been chair of the Department of Urology at Stanford University now for almost 10 years. But before that, I spent my entire career at USC under the mentorship of Dr. Donald Skinner, and you will certainly see his influence throughout this talk. I decided to try to give some perspective on how far we've come during my career in the management of bladder cancer and give some thoughts on where we're heading in the future. These are my disclosures. The diagnosis and management of bladder cancer has changed pretty dramatically over the past 30 years. Looking back to 1990, we already understood the basic clinical biology of the disease. Through evaluation of a large number of cystectomy specimens, the critical role of P53 tumor suppressor gene was already understood. However, at that time, we called all non-muscle invasive cancer superficial, even though there were wide uh, differences in the biology of these tumors. Our only real tool to treat non-muscle invasive cancer was BCG. Studies in Europe had already shown a role for post-TUR chemotherapy, but that was rarely utilized in the US. We already knew that high-grade T1 disease was aggressive and very often upstaged on pathology at cystectomy. And we showed at USC that the, the behavior of high-grade T1 was essentially identical to T2 disease. Our primary treatment for muscle invasive disease was cystectomy. And the giants in the field had already proven that surgical technique was critical to achieve good outcomes. They showed that getting a negative surgical margin was key to success and that a thorough lymph node dissection could actually cure up to 30% of patients with positive nodes. The role of chemotherapy was already being investigated as an adjunct to cystectomy for patients with extravesical disease. And randomized trials like this one done by Dr. Skinner uh, gave a hint that chemotherapy might improve the outcome. However, the challenge of delivering cisplatin-based chemotherapy in the post-operative setting was already evident. The focus of that time was really on two main areas in academic centers treating bladder cancer. The first was trying to optimize our use of chemotherapy and figure out how to combine it with surgery to improve outcomes. And the second, was focused on trying to improve the quality of life for patients undergoing this surgery with the option of continent urinary diversion. The whole field of continent diversion had already blossomed by that time with several academic surgeons around the world pioneering the development of these techniques. By 1990 at USC, almost 80% of the patients were undergoing continent diversion. And within a few years, neobladder reconstruction had supplanted continent cutaneous diversion as the most commonly used because of its simplicity and high patient satisfaction. Fast forward 20 years. We had level one evidence by then showing the benefit of maintenance BCG for carcinoma in situ over simple induction therapy. There was exception of acceptance of the role of post-TUR therapy in most academic centers, although it had not become widely used at that point. Many studies had shown that most of, much of the problem with high-grade T1 disease was just understaging at the initial TUR, and that could be identified by doing a repeat TUR routinely in those patients. Once we had ruled out occult muscle-invasive disease, BCG worked quite well for them. At that time, there also appeared a real interest in new intravesical therapies, chemotherapies, and others. And this was in part because the pharmaceutical in uh, industry recognized that there was a large potential market for these treatments. For muscle invasive disease, the trials demonstrating the benefit of neoadjuvant chemotherapy had already been completed, though it would take almost 10 years for that to become common practice. We continue to focus on optimizing the outcomes of cystectomy. Large individual institutional series showed excellent long-term cure for patients, especially those with organ-confined disease. And perioperative management continued to improve. But disappointingly, we had not really improved the stage for stage survival from cancer for these patients. 
Key studies showed the importance of hospital and surgical volume in optimizing the outcomes from surgery. And the Memorial Sloan Kettering Group published the first really detailed prospective analysis of surgical complications, which set the stage for us to evaluate our perioperative outcomes much more honestly. So there have been three really key discoveries over the past decade that brought us to where we are today, which I think is, is on the precipice of truly personalized medicine. The first was the incredible effort by the scientists involved in the TCGA project and several separate efforts by other groups using transcriptomics to separate out muscle invasive bladder cancer into different molecular subtypes. Each group used slightly different definitions and these were joined in a consensus classification system that was published this past year. As seen on the right, these different subtypes do have different prognosis. And there's also intriguing suggestion that the subtypes may have predictive power as well, responding differently to different systemic therapies. The second key event was really the exciting identification of the role of immune checkpoints in cancer progression and the development of a number of checkpoint inhibitors which were rapidly brought to market. The effectiveness for metastatic bladder cancer provided us with the first really new systemic treatment in years. Although response rates in patients who had progressed after cisplatin chemotherapy were only 20 to 25 percent, the drugs were much better tolerated than second-line chemotherapy, and there was a very exciting tail on the curve with a small group of patients who seemed to be long, in long-term remission even years after stopping the treatment. These drugs also offered an alternative to patients who were not candidates for initial platinum chemotherapy in the first line setting. That was a group of patients who generally got no treatment in the past. As you know, these drugs are now being moved earlier in the disease process and pembrolizumab was recently approved for BCG unresponsive disease. Now there are many clinical trials testing these agents alone or in various combinations with other drugs. And there are more than 25 such trials currently running or in, in the planning phase, just in the neoadjuvant setting alone. The third important discovery has been the development of new intravesical agents for non-muscle invasive disease. This is still a very large percentage of our uh, bladder cancer patients. With the help of a group of urologic oncologists, the FDA accepted a new paradigm uh, for studying these agents in high-risk non-muscle invasive cancers, which allow for the potential for fast-track approval. Pembrolizumab was the first one approved under these new rules. Pembrolizumab has been disappointing for many of us with less than 20% of patients with BCG unresponsive CIS still free of disease at one year, especially given the very high cost of the therapy and the potential for rare but very serious complications. But fortunately, scientists have developed and tested some really novel intravesical agents, including vaccines, gene therapies, and many other solutions. Several of these agents are already in or have completed phase three studies and are poised to seek approval in the near future. This group includes the three that I've shown here, the natafaragine feridenovec, which is, um, uh, has the curves shown at the right with about 24% of patients still free of disease at a year. The CG0070 adenovirus mediated oncolytic therapy, which had about a 35% uh, disease free survival at 18 months in 57 patients. And N803, which is presented by Kareem Shami at an abstract at this meeting, showing about 42% at one year in 81 patients. So these are all, I think, very exciting and will give patients another alternative uh, for their non-muscle invasive disease that is refractory to, C to BCG. So progress has been amazing, but we do have a way to go. Uh, there are several areas where I think we need advances. We need better diagnostics and better uh, ways to surveil our patients with non-muscle invasive disease. We need more accurate staging. We need to be able to truly predict treatment response for systemic treatments, and we need to minimize the burden of treatment as well. 
So in better diagnostics, can we replace cystoscopy with a urine test? That is a goal that has been um, uh, sought after for more than 25 years with a number of tests that have made it to market, but ultimately have failed to reach that goal. The ideal test will need to be rapid, ideally a point of care test with very high accuracy and not too expensive. Although no patient loves having a cystoscopy, our patients have told us that they are uncomfortable with a urine test unless it is at least as accurate as cystoscopy. New tests using uh, the DNA and RNA in urine, I think are getting closer. Here are two examples of studies done with the Cepheid platform. And many of you may be familiar with that platform because it was being used for rapid COVID tests in many hospitals at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, this study on the left is in, in screening patients, looking at the accuracy of uh, the expert bladder cancer detection system. And on the right is a, a test from RVA at Stanford, uh, looking at a group of patients also being screened for hematuria. In terms of grading, we actually lost a significant degree of discrimination with adoption of the two-grade WHO 2004 staging, uh, grading system. The end result has been to lump a large number of intermediate risk patients into the high-grade group. This has likely resulted in significant overtreatment for some patients and also has failed to really call out the patients who are truly high risk. The graph on the right shows the progression in patients using the 1973 system at the top and the 2004 system at the bottom. And if, especially if you look at the, the um, uh, uh, left-hand scale, you'll see that there's quite a, a significant better discrimination using the three-grade system. A uh, recent ISUP consensus group studied over 5,000 mm -hmm. bladder cancer patients mm -hmm. and recommended a new four grade system, mm -hmm. which they showed was superior in discriminating the progression risk for patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. This or something similar, I think would be a significant advance for urologists managing this large group of patients. It has also been disappointing that our radiologic staging of bladder cancer patients has lagged significantly behind the dramatic increases, the dramatic advances seen in prostate cancer imaging. Conventional PET CT has not added much improvement in, state, in accuracy of staging for patients with muscle invasive disease. There still are significant false negatives and even false positives for those tests. Uh, we need some new your, uh, uh, pet molecules that are specific to urothelial cancer, sort of like the PSMA PET uh, test for prostate cancer. And I am confident that those will come down the line. Pet, uh, multiparametric MRI is also uh, being uh, evaluated for bladder cancer patients. And this I think may really help with uh, identifying the depth of invasion uh, Sorry about that. Um, uh, the depth of invasion uh, of the tumors is in the bladder. Um, there have been a number of studies reported looking at both early, uh, early identification of, of muscle invasive disease um, in, in patients in, on initial presentation and also looking to evaluate muscle invasive and extravesical uh, extension on patients uh, who already um, are known to have invasive disease. Um, there are, um, sorry, um, there our colleagues in the, uh, in, uh, the UK are actually bravely embarking on a clinical trial using MRI to replace TRBT under anesthesia with a goal to shorten the time to cystectomy and hopefully improve outcomes. Finally, we're looking forward to the day when we can use tumor genomics to direct individual patients to specific therapies. The genomic classifiers so far have shown somewhat mixed results. There seems to be agreement that basal subtypes seem to benefit the most from neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and, um, also, patients with these D, uh, um, 
DNA uh, repair genes uh, mutations also seem to be very sensitive to cisplatin. However, patients with um, the classifiers have been less consistent in predicting response to checkpoint inhibitors. Although patients with tumors that have very high PDL1 expression and tumor mutational burden seem most likely to respond to these agents, some patients without those markers also respond. And most of us have been hesitant to withhold those treatments based on negative markers. There are some real challenges that need to be overcome before we reach the goal of personalized uh, therapy direction. These include problems with tumor sampling, heterogeneity, plasticity with tumors that change their subtype in the face of treatment, and a basic lack of standardization of the assays. We do have a large number of prospective clinical trials that are completed or are underway where tumor tissue is being banked and evaluated. And hopefully using some of those, the challenges uh, that I've noted here can be worked out. CTDNA is also an extremely exciting new technology that may be able to help us in managing patients. This study from Christensen and colleagues in 69 patients undergoing cystectomy with neoadjuvant chemotherapy showed that detection of tumor-specific DNA in the blood of patients before and after neoadjuvant chemo was a powerful prognostic marker. Clearance of the CT DNA when it had been present previously also correlated well with good response to therapy. But it still needs to be proven whether we should be using CTNA tests to guide our treatment decisions in individual patients. So going forward, we need to standardize our biomarkers and validate the most promising ones in prospective studies, similar to the recently completed SWOG trial testing the Coxon prediction model. We need to prove how best these markers should be used to drive specific therapy. For example, skipping chemotherapy in a patient with a luminal tumor or using chemotherapy alone in someone with a DDR mutation Will that end up with achieving the same or better outcomes than what we do today treating everybody? Whether we can improve our outcomes, I think will be the ultimate uh, goal. But keep in mind also that the host uh, with the cancer may matter as well. In this study recently that showed that uh, there was a difference in the breakdown of different gen genomic subtypes of invasive cancers in male and female patients. And finally, we need to keep working to minimize the burden of therapy for our patients and maintain their quality of life. Um, we need to figure out how to sequence all these new treatments for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, in part to manage the, the cost, which might be quite astronomical. It, as long as cystectomy is still part of our uh, treatment, we need to still focus on trying to minimize morbidity. I have to say that I don't think robotics has helped much um, and um, uh, we still need to, to do more to make the recovery quicker for these patients. Um, I also believe that going back to an ileal conduit that was developed 70 years ago can't be the only option offered for our younger and healthier patients. And I would urge all of you doing cystectomies to not give up on continent diversion as a, as a choice. Chemo radiation is becoming more and more popular, and we need to figure out if the results that, that have been obtained using highly selected patients will actually continue to be as good as cystectomy when the patients are not so selected. It also falls to the urologist to provide surveillance and manage complications for these patients following radiation, and there's much that we need to learn about that as well. So I think we have an idea of what our patients want and organizations like Beacon have really helped us understand that even better. We have become incredibly, an incredible long way over the past 30 years, but we do have a way to go. I'm hopeful and fully expect our approach to this disease will look dramatically different 30 years from now. I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to Dr. Swanson and Dr. Denstead and to all of the AUA and uh, add my thanks to the amazing effort by the uh, AUA office in making this a successful meeting. Thank you very much.